I'm Tanisha Coco, Capitan Coco is a photographer. Um, Coco is interesting because she doesn't come from a, a sort of specific fashion background, she's much more from a fine art background, which she's really brought into the project and the photography that she's done. And recently she's done lots of very exciting collaborations. I'm sure you all saw the work that she did with Gucci, which was in part both a sort of a photographic um, project that she's done with them, but also um, using her amazing, beautiful and um, like whimsical handwriting, which appeared on the garments themselves. Uh, she's also just released a new book um, and has done different projects with other brands as well, people like Maison Margiela, uh, Paco Rabanne. Um, so yeah, very successful and exciting young artist. I've also got Massimo Giorgetti with me, who's very stylish. Um, so I'm sure that you're all aware of the wonderful work of Emma Gianni, which is Massimo's baby. Um, he's He's been sort of, in, in some ways, adding a lot of fun, I think, to um, a label that has come to be known for, um, for animated, optimistic catwalk shows. And I think it'd be interesting to talk about that in the, in the current climate. Um, and then at the end, I have a wonderful Patrick Scallon, who's, I, I always describe Patrick as a real fashion expert. We were laughing before because he said, well, I've only ever worked for two people. Um, so, but they're kind of two of the best, really. So Patrick, has worked um, with currently with Juice Van Nathan and before that with Martin Margiela, so obviously such an amazing, amazing person um, to have worked with, working on the PR and the communications, so you really know how to make or break a brand. Emphasis on the make with you. Um, we're going to be talking more about imagery and sort of building a brand and the language around a brand. Um, I'll let Dan do the first question. Yes, so. Um... Building off this morning's talk, um, we have a, a very different group of people in front of us today who have all uh, experienced different cycles and, and levels of, of building a brand and its imagery from the ground up and it, participating in that in different ways. And um, uh, Patrick has done that as a communications director, Massimo as a designer, and Coco as a photographer creating those, those images. And um, you will see um, some of Coco's pictures coming up here first. Uh, the first being <laughs> from a project that we did together last year for um, with Paco Rabanne at the Festival de Hier, which was a project that uh, we incited as the designer was the jury president of the fashion jury at the, at the festival. And um, we recreated a 1960s photo shoot uh, of Paco Rabanne in the Villa Noai with, with Coco. And, um, these are, for me, a really exciting and uh, sort of transporting example of the way we can communicate on a brand's image without necessarily looking at it from a very commercial point of view and taking perhaps some clothes as, as taking seconds, um, sort of a backseat, let's say, in, in the project. And I think Coco will be one of the first people to say that um, in this room that she doesn't really like clothes and she doesn't really like fashion. So um, I think that the way that she approaches it is really honest and um, and I'd like to maybe hear a couple of words from, from her as to how you, how you treat clothes when you, when you have to photograph them. Well, <laughs> this is my, it makes it a really difficult to start <laughs> with so many people here who love fashion. Uh, having this introduction, it does such a strong statement as me hating fashion. Tell me if it was too hard. <laughs> Which is, um, it's not exactly the case. Um, I'm interested on fashion, but I think that, um, of course, the intent of uh, most brands is to create products and put it into uh, consumers' hands. But when I say I'm not so interested in the fashion, I mean that many times it's really interesting to look at the universe that a brand wants to talk about. Um, so, for example, using this um, project as an example, the Paco Rabanne and Julian Dosena, who was the creative, well, is the creative director of the brand and, uh, right now. He, there is many things outside of the fashion that we can talk about when we talk about Paco Rabanne. And I'm interested in conceiving, like getting together all these ideas about the brand without having to specifically refer to the closing. Um, 
I think that in the past, perhaps uh, the clothing element in fashion imagine, imaginary was really important. Like it was almost not. Um, it was impossible to conceive a fashion campaign without the fashion on it. But then if we go back into time, and um, we think about Comte de Garçon, for example, there is a fashion brand that has always intrigued me because they have built their own fashion advertising and imaginary, excluding the fashion, and still speaking really strongly about their own values. Then um, I think we can get to a new conclusion that sometimes, or maybe in this specific moment in fashion history, we don't need the clothes anymore to be still talking about fashion and lifestyle, which I think is a really interesting point. Um, in a way, I feel my mission as a photographer when I'm working with a brand is to help them uh, articulate that language that speaks uh, on top of the fashion. It's not only in the way that they cut the clothes or in the color palette they use to identify themselves, but the whole values that they want to represent themselves by and I think that's a little bit um, kind of, I, I hope it helps as a sort of explanation of what I think that fashion sometimes is not necessary even though we are still speaking about fashion ourselves or um, building up our own image. Well, lots of designers today refer to themselves as creative directors rather than designers and it's this idea that you're building a world rather than building a collection. I thought it was really interesting when Raph Simmons had his debut collection at Calvin Klein and in sort of the first paragraph of the notes that accompanied that collection they talked about his curatorial approach to the brand which was basically, you know, highlighting that he was turning his eye to the imagery, to the sound, to the feel of, of, um, of the collections rather than just the design of the garments. That's something that also people like David Anderson who we were talking about before, something that they, that they do is how they work. Patrick, it's really interesting actually to get your perspective on this because that's something I'm aware that in your work as a communications director, like, I'm sure a lot of people imagine that you are working with press, but actually your role is so much more varied than that. You know, you've, you've worked on huge exhibitions, you've, you know, you've just done this amazing silent archive project, which is basically a project using the Dries archive and digital. And are those touch points becoming ever more important today? First of all, good afternoon. I, I think. <laughs> Today has been a lot of information. I was listening to Mima this morning a lot. So I think I don't know what the makeup of the audience is as to young designers starting off because I think we, we tend to use words in the industry that are interchangeable: brand, designer, product, luxury. I mean, what what without being patronizing, what do all of these words actually mean? Because I'm of the generation where there's a distinct difference between. A design by the so the other category is creative director, mm. as you've just mentioned. So I think that in a way where designers are, I think the, the role of the designer as we've known it, which was an idiosyncratic creative vision that was expressed through a group of people getting together with, uh, as you were saying this morning, Alejandro, a sort of a mission or, a, 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 or having fun, simply having fun, because that's another thing you have to remember. None of this is worth it unless you're enjoying it. And, uh, you know, that, that sense of being a communications director or working with image or messaging and all of those things, it's true what Nina said this morning that it has become more compact and more sort of distinct now that social has come along. But the other thing that we should ask ourselves is do we, it, it's not because social media is there that we have to expect to participate. Maybe the most communicative thing to do is to actually abstain. And, the, and to, be in, to, to abstain doesn't mean that you're necessarily being a refuse, Nick. You're actually just making, saying, okay, I'd rather to focus on that and leave the rest up to somebody else. Mm -hmm. So the, the silent archive, for example, with Dries, um, and because we're celebrating a 100th fashion show this year, we've just done it in March and the Women's, was a very practical thing because one of the most difficult things is negotiating the rights for soundtracks and music. And we decided, well, we can't afford it, we don't want to do it, and it's going to take too much and it's too, it's too hustlesome. So we decided to actually make the, what was initially perceived as the weakness of the project its strength and call it the silent archive. Mm -hmm. So it's completely clear. And you put all the fashion shows each day. Each day, and you want, for example. Yeah. 
Yeah. And um, so I think there are a lot of things that, that come naturally when you have a sense of camaraderie and you're having fun and you're enjoying it. I think what could be a little bit intimidating, I don't want to hop the microphone, but what could be a little bit intimidating with this type of forum is that you don't want to come along to and be the old guys saying back in our day it was fantastic and today it's more difficult. But you also feel that there's a new relevance, like that, that, that sort of mentality, that 1993 and a half mentality, is probably more pertinent and real today than it has been in the past 10 years. So there is a, 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 there's another reason to have the dialogue. And for me, the most important thing, and I'll stop, is um, we're talking about fashion all the time. We're not particularly defining what that is. Is that clothing? Is that creative expression? Because what I would say, and I would challenge most people, is that if you're going, to, if we're talking about designing clothing, I think the most important thing today is to decide whether clothing is truly the medium that's best suited to your creative output. And if you're cons absolutely convinced, and that was the other really interesting thing about having the uh, the. Uh, the mechanism to get feedback from people that you trust, I forgot the term, it was a really good one, is that ask people around you, because maybe there's another forum and a lot of people are not another medium that's best suited. And it's not that because you've gone to art school you can't do fashion, because you've gone to fashion school you can't decide to be an artist. Because I see a lot of people try to squeeze who they are creatively into the medium of making clothing, and it makes them ultimately quite unhappy. You know, and I think that's the first thing as an individual, I'm not speaking as a brand, so excuse me for yeah, hugging. Yeah. That's a perfect segue into, into Massimo because he's a, a pretty happy person in my um, experience <laughs> and he makes clothes and he sells a lot of them. So um, you're an Italian designer yeah. and I think you've been really important in a new wave of, of, um, of excitement in Milan in the, in the past decade and that, that's been something that was, was lacking for quite a long time. Milan was definitely in a, in a rut in a sort of groove of, of a very particular style, and I think you were one of the breakout stars that just that, that um, added a bit of new energy there. And um, and you're not from Milan either; you're you're from outside of from town. Milan. So I think maybe if you could tell us a little bit about your beginnings and how you found fashion as well, because I find that a pretty interesting story in itself. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm not from Milano. I I was born in Rimini, and I think. Uh, I'm lucky because uh, for me my childhood uh, was very very important because uh, positive people, uh, rich, uh, see. Uh, also, I mean, it's uh, it's very was very important for the for the clubs, uh, for the discotheque, and I think this built to me this uh, this uh, this was very important because also my when I was a teenager and. Um, I had beautiful memories, my, and my family also, uh, my aunt, uh, they had a big uh, company of embroideries. So I think I, I learned a lot about Italian, Italian taste, uh, Italian color. And when I started MSGM in 2009, uh, it was not uh, a happy moment uh, for, the, for the world, uh, for the markets. Uh, a lot of people advise uh, me not to, you are crazy, you cannot start uh, a brand uh, in this year, in 2009. But at the end, I think the secret, uh, I think there is a huge difference between, uh, uh, between to work uh, to a brand, uh, it's uh, already done, uh, it's already built, uh, and to build a brand, because uh, it's very, very difficult. I, I love my job, I, I love my job, I, I think I'm lucky, I'm, uh, I'm blessed, I'm not lucky, but uh, it's uh, very difficult because it's, uh, it's a continuous uh, fight, it's a continuous struggle because uh, uh, market is important, uh, prices are important. Uh, at, the end of the, at the end of the day, you have to sell clothes. Uh, of course, you have to create uh, a wonderful orchestra, you have to choose the right talent uh, uh, close to you, and I think this is uh, the more difficult work, uh, the, more, the more difficult job, uh, to find the right people, the right talent, the right stylist, the right photographer. 
And uh, at the end, uh, I have to say, it, now it's very difficult because uh, uh, it's really about uh, the right uh, price, the right quality, the right, uh, the right position, the right distribution. I, I mean, if you put a beautiful dress in the wrong store, it doesn't work. If you do a beautiful dress or a beautiful sweatshirt with the wrong prices, it doesn't work. So uh, I think there is a, a huge difference also between uh, 10 years ago, 5 years ago, because uh, uh, till uh, the social revolution and the business of e-commerce, because uh, now we have to say also that we are selling clothes on e-commerce, on uh, internet. A lot of people around us, uh, uh, we are buying uh, with our iPhone, and it's completely different because uh, before, uh, really, till uh, five years later, three years later, you went in a store, you touched the clothes, you touched the fabric, you touched the embroidery. Now it's only about to see. It's only about uh, to see from a screenshot. Uh, so it's, uh, we have to realize this, we have to, under to understand this, uh, and we have to work, uh, and we have to create, uh, I agree totally with, uh, with Coco that uh, you have uh, also to, to give uh, a meaning, a, a, an importance value to the clothes uh, because uh, you have to sell clothes but you have also to, to give an importance to these clothes. Uh. Both yourself and Patrick and Coco to an extent as well, you've, you've talked as if there were kind of these degrees of separation between different products within the industry. So like you have clothes, but then there's also fashion and then there's also luxury and maybe that they are three distinct things that overlap in certain respects. And I wonder if you think that that's something, I mean, I wouldn't say, for example, that a lot of fashion brands are necessarily a luxury brand and maybe the designers would intend them to be so, particularly a designer that's more avant-garde. And you've all touched on that and insinuated slightly different opinions on it. And I just wonder what you all, like Patrick, what's your take on it? I think if I could be Donald Trump or any dictator and ban one word from our lexicon, it would be the word luxury. <laughs> I think it's so hackneyed, it's so handed around, it means nothing today. And I think that, I think, I don't know, around 96, I don't, when did that start? Around 96, 97 ish. And I think that, that what happened is that it just became an excuse to. To justify the labels, often, you know, and uh, and it became a branding exercise. And I think luxury is, if, um, okay, we're, we're not going to go down that rabbit hole of de defining luxury, but that's one thing. I think clothing. That's why I said earlier, for creative talent, is that is it the medium that you want? Because I mean, it's really important. What Massimo says as well is when you're selling clothing. That's one thing that, for example, is very very palpable in Dries's world. I mean, Dries sells clothing and is very happy to do so. And, you know, we've also lived a period where I think as an industry we were a little bit disingenuous mm -hmm. and that, you know, we were putting collections out on runways. I've also faced with a very unquestioning and slightly, yeah, let's leave it at unquestioning press, who wasn't really examining the fact that are these clothes arriving into the shop? If they are, in what way? And in a certain way, clothing became a loss leader to sell accessories and shoes. So in a certain way, I think stripping back that, that we've used the, somebody used the word transparency this morning, which is important, wasn't the question. Uh, and I think that one of the things that we need a little bit more is more questioning and more information and a press that's challenging a little bit the system a little bit more. But I think clothing and its creative expression is important because, as Coco said earlier, I, I, well, I don't feel that one of the things that we have as a general challenge is that clothing is no longer as important to an individual as a means of communicating who they are mm -hmm. as it used to be. And that's something that we as an industry, or we as a group of people, creative people, need to actually understand and fully embrace. People have so many other ways of being who they are. Do you feel, and it's interesting to get everyone's opinion on this, I feel like image is more important than ever to people in defining who they are. You know, before maybe you wore a slogan t-shirt to say something, now you just use a tweet or an Instagram. But it's, it's all about imagery, and I wonder the knock-on effect that that is having on, on the fashion industry, because it feels like that explosion of social media has also run alongside 
fashion becoming a pop industry and something that everyone engages with and you see, you know, fashion brands have sort of you know, millions of Instagram followers, almost like celebrities. But what are we saying is fashion? That's the thing, without getting too esoteric. Mm -hmm. You know, what is fashion in our instance, you know? And I think there's, there are lots of different expressions of it. Hmm? Like. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, no, no, but that, no, it's yours. <laughs> Sorry. I think it's important if I, um, to think about uh, the logomania, uh, because uh, we, we came from four years, uh, three years, and but, uh, also it's a trend that continues a lot. Uh, and I think this trend uh, reflect, really reflects uh, the, the fashion, the world uh, that we are living now. Why the logo is so important? Uh, why? Uh, it's really insane. For example, also my brand, but a lot of brand. Uh, for example, my brand is a logo brand. Uh, and uh, I remember when I, when, I start, when I did the first logo sweatshirt in 2011, I, I can say that I, I probably I was one of the first uh, in the winter of 2011. And when I saw the, the, at the end of the same campaign, 3,000 pieces uh, for me was a, a huge uh, number of, of for a production, uh, but also in Asia, in America. And uh, what it means, uh, uh, it's nice to think about the importance behind uh, a logo t-shirt, a sweatshirt t-shirt. Because we have to think of a lot of people, a lot of customers, they want to buy. Uh, now there are a lot of examples in uh, fashion with the logo t-shirt, logo sweater, but also in the bag, in the shoes. Uh, and I think now uh, real people, they, they want to, to, to enter in, in this kind of group, in this kind of gang, in this kind of... And uh, you have to create uh, the world. Uh, you have to create, uh, uh, sure, but also Paco Havana is a uh, uh, It's a brand, for example, for me, it's, uh, he did an amazing job uh, on, the, on the logo. Uh, and uh, if, you, if you think uh, the logo was about uh, 80s, uh, 90s, uh, we had uh, 10 years without the logo. Maybe from, uh, maybe more, because uh, I remember the last logo was in Utlang on the end of the 90s. I, I work in a store and I sold a lot of uh, El Utlang t-shirt and uh, sweatshirt. But after El Utlang, 1999, we, we waited almost 15 years for the logo trend. It's very interesting though. And uh, uh, we are a group, that we are a fashion seminar, and I think we have to think uh, very, very well because fashion really is really about what real people want, so what real wants to buy, to dress, uh, and to put on. Uh, so, I need to attach to certain yeah. identifiers yeah. to um, <laughs> almost to justify why they purchase something, don't they? I. I think the logo culture is really interesting. Yeah. Um, when I think of fashion consumption, uh, I always try to bring it to the most basic level. Um, for me, some it's an anthropoly, uh, anthropoly, anthropology <laughs> study. Yeah. Um, that's what has always really interested me uh, about fashion. I always try to think about it. I always try to think of the teenagers, uh, which is a super important phase in our life in which we are kind of trying to say to the world who we are. And then in that moment, we decide one brand, and we decide to put on a t-shirt with a logo. And for me to see, say, a Louis Vuitton instead of Paco Rabanne or a Gucci, um, pretty much is saying, I stand by these values. And I think it's what it goes behind the logo, and what I was talking about, a brand not needing the fashion is about creating this kind of um, system of values that you synthesize in one word. And when a teenager put on a t-shirt that says Gucci, it's kind of telling to their friends, I'm cool because I'm standing by the same values. Yeah, yeah. And I think that then when we grow up, and we don't want to be, um, basically don't feel that naked in front of other people yeah. and have like this need of other people to know that we need to tell them that we are very Gucci because we can afford it. 
uh, then we are still buy the Gucci shirt, but if we make sure that it says Gucci in the buttons, uh, if someone looks into the details. So I think we are starving in very ordinary and kind of like shouting to everyone what our values are. And then little by little, as we gain confidence and we form our personality, we take more risks. Um, we kind of like don't need to insist so much in the fashion choices that we are making. And I find that very interesting. And answering as well to your question, for me, fashion is about that. It's about giving people the possibility to uh, build their own identity. Um, before even they talk about themselves, because yeah, we have like the social networks, but we still have uh, every day this moment in which we introduce ourselves to other people, and the first thing they see about ourselves is the hairstyling we are wearing and the jumper we are wearing in many cases, and that is still very important. So that's why I think fashion is still important because we are still using the fashion to tell other people who we are. If it's with a logo, or if we, I don't know, in your case, I don't know, like if we analyze each of us, I'm sure everyone here can uh, put together so much information about where we come from or what we want to say with the way we dress. I think that's what was so interesting about the um, My Calvin's campaign, which I'm sure a lot of people saw. It's like I do something, so I walk in my Calvin's, I do whatever in my Calvin's. Because it was using all of the language of sort of your identity and you know using the language of social media status update and you informing some someone of something about yourself but bringing it back to a logo and a brand. I think what's interesting here and it kind of goes back to I think you Patrick you raised the issue of like what is fashion and I keep coming back to that in my head with these things because it's how does this relate Sorry, to you? I didn't say what is fashion, so we need to define no, what defining it, exactly. people in exactly. We need to anchor it in something. Because do you see this as being, because what we're talking here about is identity and branding and naming, and it's not necessarily design. I mean, a lot of the logos are beautifully designed objects, but it's a very different thing to designing a garment. For, for me, it's not, it, without going into a cloud of sort of interpretation, whatever, I think one of the other things that's, that's interesting this morning, and that's why I'm making a distinction between brand, is that there's a push goal thing as well. Is that, you know, a lot of creative spirits, if they want, uh, they want or to express their vision through clothing, there's also a need to be idiosyncratic, there's a need to be, this is, let's face it, the least democratic process on earth is a creative one. You know, we can, there's no such thing as a, a designer ashram, even though at Marjali it was sort of presented to be that for a certain period of time. For a long time, it was very clear. Martin Marjali was a creative director. There were other people who were working with him, and his co-founder, Jenny, founded it. Dries is absolutely the creative director of his, of his company. And, you know, it, it, it can be less or more democratic in certain, in certain processes. So what could be a little bit confusing for some people here today is that it's very important to bring the, the fruits of your creative talent forward onto the market, but you also have to know when it has to be your way or the highway, or when, it, when you're going to actually lead people places rather than following what the need will be. And I think there's nothing wrong with brands who follow the tide or go in a direction which is decidedly more and strategically more commercial. That's very important. But the the other is true as well, where the the image is not the image is something intrinsic. It's not something logicized. It's something very very instinctual. It's instinctive. And do you think that's the case that brands who often, as you say, sort of set the, the pace and, and define a path, rather than being more pragmatic in the approach of sort of you know almost designed by trend report? Do you think those are the ones that can be to an extent? Um, not underappreciated in their time, but maybe appreciated even more after their time. Like I've, I've been very interested at the moment at the huge buzz and interest around Margiela, and Margiela through the eyes of other designers that are now creating, you know, sure. that are getting young people to be interested in Margiela almost by buying the work of a different brand. And there's such an interest in that at the moment. And you know, working with, with Martin Margiela, would you say that he's an example of that? Uh, I would, but also the other thing is that the mechanism of communicating was very different at the time. Mm -hmm. For example, when you think about it, and this is nothing that's very important, is that distribution is also a means of communication. And, it's, it's, and this is the idea of what we're talking about, shops buying from another, seeing where, you know, that's why there are a lot of anchor to, um, distribution who other, other shops look at. I mean, 
the, a lot of these stores that say in the 90s and up, up to the, the late 80s and, and to the mid 90s were owned by very passionate, especially independent women who believed in clothing. For example, you had Linda Lock, you had Jenny Merritt, you had Sandy Patton Bong, you had Mary Louisa, you had all of these women who had very close relationships with designers and were very passionate and also knew that they had to place an order that was sufficient as to support the person to go to a factory in Italy to get their collection made. But these were very idiosyncratic, instinctive decisions made by passionate people. Mm -hmm. The thing is that, and, and without confusing my hopes for reality too much, you can feel that that's coming back again, and that's what's exciting, and that's what's very optimistic about this period, is that there's a whole new generation who's understanding that you need content above and beyond a label. You, a logo is not enough, it's the spirit, and that's what I think is interesting about what you see, what uh, Santa Michele is doing at Gucci. That's why I'm certainly I disagreed a little bit with me mm -hmm. today, is that for me, Gucci is a trampoline, it's a marketplace in which a creative spirit <coughs> exists and is allowed to express who they are. And uh, yes, he used the codes of that, uh, of that company, but he used them almost as an irreverence or ironically, but in a very idiosyncratic way. And I think people today, they want that investment and they want that content, and they want to feel that emotion close to it. Mm. And I think it's very important. Do you both agree with that? That the sense of this return, a lot of designers at the moment who I'm speaking to, they talk about this like return to creativity, which is really interesting. Are you feeling that at the moment? Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I guess so. I mean, as um, we have said before, like my connection to fashion, like uh, I'm you know, my way of dressing is really basic. I dress like an uh, office man could be an accountant. Uh, <laughs> so what really interests me uh, is really this universe and creative process. That's why I asked Alejandro before, why do you make clothes specifically this way and not in any other way? And I think like, I think many brands right now, I'm going back to that, as you have well said, I me mean, as a creative person, as an artist, even though I work in relation to fashion, what I care about is where all these ideas come from. And I couldn't be less interested in a brand that doesn't have that bank of ideas and um, references and things they want to talk about through their clothes. I think it's really, it's very obvious when a brand is just trying to sell and is just giving you the um, product or the clothes as a utility. Because I wear clothes just as an utility, but if I am to be interested about a brand, it needs to be about their message, what they are trying to say, what kind of artists they are supporting. And for me, that's a little bit the difference between, well, we were even talking maybe luxury is an ugly word, that's not the the right word, but that's when you compare something like uh, Inditex, that is just giving people, uh, you know, many many different options. But they are, and that's their ultimate, their ultimate goal, and uh, their marketing goal is not about making a specific statement. It's about giving people this um, idea of democracy. You all can all consume these other ideas, but these other ideas have already been created by someone. And that's kind of, for me, that's the difference between the two markets. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there is a huge difference because the, there is not a value, there is not a, a message inside, behind. Uh, and I think also, this morning I, I did an example during an interview and I I realized it was uh, amazing. Uh, last week uh, I saw uh, a nocturnal animal of Tom Ford, uh, the movie. And uh, Saturday I, was, uh, I went to the center of Milano and I bought uh, for my first time uh, uh, all the toilette from Tom Ford. Uh, and it's completely, and I realized uh, that uh, it's uh, the secret behind the fashion because uh, um, Tom Ford is completely different. So, you know, my world is luxury, sexy, and but uh, with this movie, I realize uh, the brain of Tom Ford, uh, his vision. And uh, it's like, uh, okay, I want to have something of him. And it's the difference between, uh, uh, between Gucci and between uh, Unitex, uh, between a brand. Uh, and uh, I think the secret is uh, it's a real, to be honest with you, to be honest with your message, with your vision, 
with uh, you want to, to say. I remember very well when uh, I started, uh, and uh, from the beginning I, I did cocktail dress and sweatshirt, from the beginning. And I, I remember very well some uh, press, some journalists uh, that uh, told me, but you have to decide, or you do cocktail dress or you do sweatshirt. Because uh, at the beginning I, I, I mix uh, a cocktail dress and blue dress with a destroy sweatshirt. And uh, now I'm smiling, but uh, uh, this time uh, I felt, oh my God, maybe they're right. Uh, and uh, I remember also uh, one review is not a designer, it's uh, a casual, it's, a, it's only about sweatshirt, it's only about sport. But okay, I, I go ahead and I continue with my story. It's me, it's a sport and a romantic. I really love this kind of... Uh, and now, after, now, here we are, so um, it's very, very important, uh, also for a young brand, because I'm still a young brand, uh, this, the message you want to do. The, so it's, and how, how have you been translating that in your campaigns? Because I know you've worked with some, some pretty amazing photographers like Walter Pfeiffer, and you've just shot a new campaign with yeah. someone else. I'm, not sure if you want to say this, but um, I can, can could, you, could, you, could you just sort of explain a little bit how you translate I that sort of contrast I, into the imagery? I started from simple photographer in Milano and uh, step by step I move up in high quality. But I think also the photographer you choose, uh, the, the, the stylist you work, uh, it's really like your vision, it's uh, like the message you want to do. Um, of course, uh, um, I have to say one important thing. Before to afford this kind of photographer, you have to sell a lot. So it's, uh, 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 or maybe, uh, of course, at the beginning they can do for you a special price, uh, a special, uh, also for the models, also for stylists. But uh, uh, this is important because uh, the people now, it's, uh, they are very, very, um, attend about you, about your work, and not only the press and the buyer, but also the people from Instagram, from, from social. And uh, what I want to, to communicate with my, my choice, I want to communicate that uh, my brand is an happy brand, but at the same time it's uh, maybe not intellectual, but uh, it's, uh, sometimes it's a brain, a brain brand, because uh, I, I love to, I did collaboration with artists, with Mauricio with Carter, with Nico, now we are doing another collaboration. But it's also a lot of uh, mattoni, come si dice, a lot of... Uh, Different yeah, uh, you are building for, to, to arrive, uh, maybe soon or later, to a final house, a final building, and then the, the final building is the brand. So I'm still building my brand. I, I think I'm in the middle. Yeah, I got it. So I, I just wanted to make because I know that I started to say something that finishes about the women with the shops, etc. The reason I brought that up was that it, at that stage your image was also a lot of word of mouth, and you were dealing with your your own group of people. We call that a tribe today, whatever. And you were happy to have these people to be beneficiaries or ambassadors or. For, for your work to be expressed through their wishes, their needs, their vision, and all the rest of it. And I think that's something that we have to be careful with a little bit when it comes to social media and going directly to the market as well. Because often what we're doing is we're bursting a bubble, which is a bubble of interpretation that belongs to other people, where your work can be appropriated by them and brought forward in their lives, and they can represent you as, as often better than yourself. And that's where I think one area where Marjal was very good, it was, it was basically creating that space for ambiguity, creating for that space for interpretation, and also it's that space that often allows you to belong to people. Whereas when you become a little bit too didactic, or too explanatory, or too, you know, this is what we're doing, this is why we're doing it, it can also crush that way of belonging to people, and that's very important. But that's also changed a lot, whereas before that was the only way of doing it. Now you have the choice, but I think people do have the choice. They have the choice of participating in that level and doing it the same way as everybody else or not. Mm. You were kind of making sounds of agreement. 
No, I, well, in this specific uh, subject, um, I think that, uh, well, uh, I was bored at the time that Ms. Omarty Martina was an um, emerging run. <laughs> Um, but I think something I really admire about them, um, after reading a lot about their history, is um, their decision of leaving this space for people to wonder and question. I think it's really boring when an artist is telling you directly how you have to understand their piece. So it's for me as an art lover and um, design lover, I love to just go to a museum, not read anything in the walls, and just go see the piece. Or if I go to a fashion show, I'm never going to, there is always like, um, there is normally something like this that explains everything about the collection, the press release. I love not reading press releases, uh, and just go to see sure. the, the piece. And yeah, as you well, it, were saying, there are people who are going to think for you anyways, and are not going to make deductions. Why would you anticipate yourself telling them what they have to think? Yeah. And I think that was really, I, I think, I wasn't there at the time, as I have to say already, but I think um, me, Ms. Martin Margiela, back then, they were pioneers on doing that. Um, I I, it's giving people the space to come to to come to the brand, isn't it? To like feel like they've discovered it themselves. And yeah. it's and the same with your photography, you know, letting people find it yeah. and interpret it. Or on even another level, the, the silent archive is, sorry. Okay. Uh, even with the silent archive for, for the streets, because streets also has that uh, approach as well. It's silent archive, you know, people can just imagine what the music might have been like, they weren't at the show. But that was the other thing as well as about the Inspirations exhibition in Paris, is that was a very, that was the opposite, that was a very naked and almost mathematical connection between clothing and its inspiration, but to show people that, you know, this is how other creative fields can be shown together. And actually one of the greatest challenges in that exhibition was to allow clothing to stand beside art. And a lot of the time, some of these art pieces were coming with pages and pages of indications as how they could exist in a space. And putting a dress in front of them was certainly not one of them, you know? <laughs> so it, that took a lot of time, and yet at the same time, and it was difficult, you didn't want to, it, it wasn't to be facile, but it was also some, to show that, in fact, inspiration, that spark that we all need to have joy and to be successful at what is being done, it can happen really inst instantly and, and when you least expect it. I would like to add one important thing that uh, before I ask uh, to Patrick, uh, because I remember that Dries uh, never did had a campaign. Uh, yeah. It's uh, true. Yeah. And uh, for me, it's, uh, it's uh, very interesting to think about because I think at the end, uh, we can speak uh, about everything, but at the end, uh, we, the clothes, the final clothes, the final dress, or uh, the final trouser, has to create an emotion when you buy it. Yes. Because uh, we can talk about uh, everything, about me, about designers, photograph, PR, and blah, blah, blah. But at the end, the, the dress, uh, the clothes, uh, in the e-commerce, in a store, has to create, uh, has to create one need. I want to buy, I want to, and it's very interesting for me that there is a case, uh, because uh, if you think in 25, 25 years, uh, one, no campaign, uh, but uh, it's still uh, so cool, uh, so desirable, so, so wearable. And for me, it's, uh, it's really like a, a study, to, a, a case to study, because uh, um, it's, uh, it's uh, the importance of the final products, so the final, uh, the final pieces at, uh, for me, uh, at the, the, the right uh, target, the right price, the right... Because also Dries uh, did an amazing job about position, yes. about... Uh, it's a luxury, but it's uh, an afford, an afford uh, luxury, it's uh, half of the whole. So uh, it's very, very important this, uh, because uh, um, Coco before told that luxury is not a good word now. It's true, because uh, it's luxury, it's a little bit a fake business because it's about accessories, not about real clothes. I, for example, I discovered this in last years. I didn't know this. 
And I think also a lot of people in this room, they don't know that luxury brand uh, sell the 90% of, of uh, accessories and not clothes. And it's, uh, it's because the contemporary brand now are so growing very fast because uh, they, they are selling clothes uh, instead of the luxury brand. So it's, uh, I think, for example, for a young generation, they, has, uh, they, they, they have to know this. Uh, because uh, if you are a young designer, what I want to do? I want to sell clothes or I want to sell bags or shoes? It's very like a first question to, you can ask to yourself. Uh, and uh, you can choose, of course, if you are more talented in clothes. You can develop in clothes and you can improve in clothes and if you are talented. I think it's very, very important the, the, this kind of... Uh, of uh, it's, it's really like to share fashion twice uh, into, into rooms, uh, accessories and clothes. Sorry for that. No, that was good. Do we have any questions before we finish up today? A um, question about the consumers. Of course, you as a designer and PR people, you want to have certain customers. What if you have the wrong customers? How you change the brand to be from a streetwear to premium or to high end even? Uh, sorry, I'm just, uh, yeah. uh, this is about repositioning. Re yeah. yeah. Well, I'd say you, you don't, don't get rid of the old ones, just add new ones. <laughs> no idea. Yeah. Yeah. Possibly. I, I mean, I think the wrong customer, it's, it, uh, hold on, it, to be honest, this is a funny thing, it's often people will say, well, you know, this brand has bought, to go back to Maxwell's point about clothing and accessories, you know, one of the things that it, you know, when is it, when is a designer's signature a signature, and when it is a lack, when is it a lack of evolution? And you know, and often what happens is that one of the exciting periods creatively and also commercially is when you're selling into your peers, and that's the thing that a career starts with. By the way, there's one advice I'd say: write ideas down because they make them very quickly when you're younger. They don't always come <laughs> so easily when you're older. So write them down and put them in. in, in in folders, but I'd say that would be one of the things that people say is that a client helping grow older with the designer because their signature is very underlined. Well, then that's when people start becoming less designers and more creative directors, get younger people into the studio, and then reposition that way. That can happen. And one may never know if there may be an unexpected customer base that you might find that, that you never even thought about. I mean, you may position a product and a label and, and a collection for a certain market that you think is going to work and then suddenly you realize that you've opened up a whole other channel or you've completely missed the mark. I mean, these things, these things happen in a, in a world that's changing so much and with what Patrick was talking to about the direct-to-customer link now that, you know, whether it's going through the channel of the, of the wholesaler and the influencer, whether that influencer is a store or is now a blogger, all of those different channels will create different markets and, and different opinions of, of your product. And unfortunately, sometimes it's those girls with millions of followers that, that are the make or break of a young brand. And some brands can just, you know, have this overnight success and then and then a, nothing afterwards. It's I guess it's as Massimo was saying, it's about that slow burn of, of building something slowly and, and, and listening as much as you can. I think we'll see, you have to keep in mind that like, brands are people made, like you can never dictate your customer. And I think that's a mistake that some brands have made in the past and that's what's so interesting about the present is, is you realise that you can't tell people how they respond to something and it's like you can't so, and that is one of the interesting things that social media has done, is it's shone that light on, on the fact that you can't control response. Um, you can't dictate who buys or who likes your pictures or who follows you. And brands have really had to work with that. And, you know, we did talk a little bit about logos earlier, and it relates quite interestingly to that point, because the logo mania that we're seeing sort of back in fashion at the moment, actually what you're seeing a lot of brands do is appropriate appropriation of their own brand. So, you know, certain labels that were taken up by a particular subculture or a section of the community related to music or what have you, that was really frowned upon by the brand originally, then they're now almost making garments that reflect that. So, and you, you've seen, you see that from high fashion, you know, the Louis Vuitton logo and like their relationship with Dapper Dan, you know, who's a 
had a shop in Harlem and basically made fakes, and now he's being referenced in a Louis Vuitton official press release. And you see it with sportswear brands like the Champion Hoodie, which is a huge hip-hop item, which was completely unacknowledged by them, and now I think brands are realizing that they have to tell those stories and, and accept those stories. They can't dictate who the brand is for, and it can be quite dangerous to try and do that, I think. Sorry, that was a really long answer to a very <laughs> simple question. Thank you to all of our wonderful panellists today um, for coming from all over the world and I, I hope you enjoyed and I think I will pass the microphone to our final panel.